Hello, friends, and welcome to the Season 14 recap of Treaty United Building a Nation, which, of course, is live over on Twitch right now. And I realise that often when it's transfer window time, which is what it is, of course, uh, we tend to not make a lot of signings. This one is going to be different, I promise you, because we've basically already done all the scouting, and it's now, right now, is just going to be a stream of us just going through a list of 150 pretty much fully scouted players and going, we'll have you, we'll have you, we'll have you. It's going to be epic. So join me over there in a bit. But first, let me just catch you up on what's been going on here. And if you do enjoy these, of course, drop a like on the video. That would be fantastic. Let's me know you want me to keep doing them. That would be awesome. And of course, if you want to catch the VODs in full, they're over on the second channel. Link in the description down below. So jumping straight in, youth intakes, players. So this year, we had a pretty crap youth intake. Once again, it was promised to be a golden generation. Ended up as a half star intake. Uh, I'm not going to bang on about how stupid that is, that that happens every time. But whatever, we move. You now know. <laughs> this was our best player in that intake. This is Jamie Coffey. We've now replaced our head of youth development. Not because we thought our head of youth development was bad, because he wasn't. He was objectively very good. But we felt that he needed a change just to see for science if the, any differences would come about, basically. Um, now, obviously, we haven't seen the uh, the fruits of that yet. But that will be next year. We'll have to sort of uh, talk about that next time around. But yes, Jamie Coffey, the best player in it. Good finishing. Okay composure as well to go along with it. Six foot tall. Okay physicals. Mercenary personality, though. Injury prone and red consistency. It's not ideal, really. Um, but yeah, once again, consistent. Uh, our youth intakes have been garbage for a long time. Then again, that's still decent. It's just we haven't seen anyone that I'm like, yes. Now, nipping over to the loan farm, because this is a, uh, well, the loan farm is always, it continues to grow. And this year, it's going to grow a lot. The loan farm. Now, it's difficult because I accidentally forgot that I was going to be having to do the recap video and such. I'm at the, pers the starting point for today's stream and not what we finished off last time, which means annoyingly I've lost the player stats for the season we were just in because I changed the way I was doing stuff off stream. So that's a bit annoying so i do apologize i sort of have to show you them from this screen instead because when i try to click on them here obviously they're wiped so rastislav sluka with nine goals and five assists uh santa maria with his four goals and five assists there too galfio is six and six as well matos did solidly for the second half of the year nice to get him out uh irvin again as well there tiara silva jean yves leclerc more on him in a bit um kennedy as well out on loan you can see that the loan farm is definitely building now of course um there are some players that have now returned from their loans and have been like sent out elsewhere or whatnot but for the most part it's growing and this year i expect to get at least another five or six players in and then out on loan to go with it on top of that too uh, because of course we're only at the start of the window so these are all the loans that you're seeing right now these guys are guaranteed to be at these clubs for the full season that we're about to do so that's good and this is the season that they've just gone i don't know why they're still here glad they are though so you could at least see that so at the very least we've got some of those guys floating about doing business for other irish sites and other irish sites is certainly a topic we'll come back to later but what you really want to know is signings. Last time, it was a bit of a disappointment in the sense that losing Zlatko and barely signing anybody. Things have definitely changed for that front for the moment uh, over the course of this year, but really building up to what's about to happen on stream right now. But let's get into the signings. The first up, weirdly, and hear me out here, is an out. Barbara Bruggen, sort of, sort of an out, has left. Um, we decided that we needed to try and find a new goalkeeper. And then Porto offered us £20 million for Barbara Bruggen, with a slight caveat. I was able to get them to agree to load him back to us for the season, which was weird because they were clearly trying to sign a first choice goalkeeper and they just let us have him back for the year. So they paid us 20 million and then we got to play him and we were paying the same wages as before. You might also notice that his contract goes for another year. Yeah, they let me extend the loan as well. The funniest part about it, in addition to that, was they then tried to loan our backup goalkeeper off of us because they didn't have a keeper. <laughs> So essentially, they've paid us £20 million for us to keep our goalkeeper, which is good times. So Bart is still here for another season as well, on top of that. 29 caps for the Netherlands now, but we also got £20 million out of the deal. So yeah, we kind of just got a free loan of 20 million quid that we may not ever have to pay back. And the only other out this season was Dominic Lynch on a free transfer to St. Pat's. That's it as far as the outs go. Now the ins. This is where things get interesting. Now I forget if I showed you these guys in the last recap video. These were the pl players that we'd already sort of signed up to be a replacement for... Um, Zlatko as he'd gone. But if I haven't, then I'll quickly show them now. Vojslav Novakovic was the first of the two. He is currently being bidded on by massive sides like Chelsea, Man City. We think there's a cracking player here. He needs more football this season and we're going to make sure he gets it because there's clearly a reason that they're interested in him. And I think we've got him tight. I mean, look at this. We've got him on a three-year deal there. And I think there's a... It's only a one-year boat clause, but still, that's pretty damn good. Um, he hasn't really found much football. Only seven appearances in the league for us last year. And actually, no goals? What? Was that? He must have scored in the cup games or something. Made some substitute appearances. So he definitely needs football. But for the price, can't say no. Then we also had Jan Vosterek for £4 million as well. He's still wanted, but by slightly smaller clubs, I think. 
Nope, it's the same sides. We made some great transfer business there, clearly. Uh, this year, he has played a bit. Uh, 25 appearances in the league and 13 goals. Started off really strong with him in there too. Made some tactical changes, which we'll talk about later as well. But again, for £4 million, we felt that it was a good piece of business at the time. And I do feel like one of these guys could definitely be the replacement long-term for both Zacho and, of course, Emmett Doran, who is still here. We then brought in Jarrell Matas, who, of course, would have seen out on loan at Derry City, for, I think, £300,000, uh, just because he was available and he was cheap. And we thought, you know what? He'd be doing nice work for some other sides. We just wanted more bodies in. So we did that, and you can see his value's already shot up too, which is nice. And in the same kind of vein, it was Marcus Norbeck, uh, another right back that can kind of play all over the place. He's out on loan at St. Pat's. He cost, I think, uh, 900k, rising to 1.5 million potentially with a ridiculous clause. So that's unlikely to come in. But we were just trying to pick up players for the farm, really. And he is another of those. The big first team signing, I would say, in that period was this guy, Jonas Kubek. Uh, five and a half million pounds from Sparta Prague. Um, he's had a bit of a weird time. So... Obviously, you can see he's done pretty well this season. 17 games in the league for us and six goals, um, which you can't see because I'm hiding it. But like, I'll just show you quickly his record for us this year. It's been pretty solid. And 12 goals and nine assists in all competitions, which is very, very good. Unfortunately, we got into a bit of a pickle because he insisted on being played as an in uh, inverted winger. But then which we then set up a personalized instruction so that when he played, he would play it as an inverted winger. However, when we were trying to get through some extra games on stream, we were insta-resulting things. And would you believe it? The insta-result ignores personalized instructions for players. So then he was actually playing as an inside forward. And then he got pissed at me and now wants to leave. So that's good. But hopefully we can rectify that because he's a very, very solid option. Has been given Moses Maini a big run in uh, this year as well. And the last of the signings is Jean-Yves Leclerc. Yes, that's right. Bosnian and Jean-Yves Leclerc. 700k is the maximum amount that the deal could cost him. He's been on loan at Zelenshichar, but he will return... Uh, his loan finishes in six months, which is fine. Uh, we expected that to be the case. We just let him stay out there for a little bit because he was never going to be a homegrown player anyway, but he is someone for the farm later down the line. Uh, and you can see that a lot of this year has been mostly hunting for the farm, for the other the loan farm type of players. The, the summer we're, the winner we're about to have is the opposite of that. It's us going through, a, it's going to be a bit of both. We expect to spend in excess of 30 million pounds, if not more, because we have so many different players. To give you an idea of what we're looking at here, this is our scout priority list and it currently has 200 players on it. Would you like to, I mean, look at some of the, right, let me just sort by recommendation. Look at what we have scouted, ready to go after through this period. Um, it could get a little bit tasty. And this is what we've spent the whole year, basically, getting ready to start actioning some of these deals. There are so many players in here. Look at all of these guys, all sort of your five-star potential. There's still a few that aren't fully scouted, but most of them are. It's a bit ridiculous. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Just going through these guys, one after the other, seeing who we want to pick up because there are so many good players our transfer budget is 26 million as well so it's pretty damn good right now let's talk about how the league's gone this year and we need to talk tactics too so we got off to a pretty much the most perfect start you can see vosteret was flying in uh everything was looking very very good indeed now at one point after the, a certain point of the season, which I won't talk about just yet, um, we found ourselves in a position where we had a huge string of league games on stream in a row for like three hours. And we decided to use it as a bit of a tactical incubator, which was around this sort of point here, where we started trying to... Basically, the idea was, I didn't think that our attacking midfielder was being utilized properly. So we decided to make some tactical tweaks in order to try and get the best out of him and make a more balanced system for the team, which I definitely believe we've done now with some additional tweaks later down the line. But the resulting of that was essentially three major changes after a lot of tweaking. Firstly, our attacking mid, which I'll show you the tactic in a bit, is now a Trecotista. Um, and we're no longer forcing the play down the wide areas. We have no direction for our play. It's just wherever you want, which is good. And we now play a slightly narrower attack. And for whatever reason, that seems to work really nicely for us uh, because Mihai Alaku was the subject of a £47 million transfer bid from Arsenal midway through the season. After literally maybe 10 games after we made this switch, he was just flying. And all of a sudden, big club started circling so clearly we were getting something out of him but needless to say we had a very very comfortable season like insanely comfortable domestic here uh, and Eric Doran of course was pushed back through the middle again at one point due to the fixture congestion and just took off like a house on fire uh, he's back to his absolute best now which is fantastic uh, you can really see how much we were just dominating towards the end of the year we did drop a few points whilst rotating uh, for various European competitions but once again uh, we won everything eSports Cup extra I Extra IA FAI Cup Final, League, Irish Champions Cup, President's Cup. The uh, the standard quintuple that we always seem to do. So I'll just quickly show you the league now, which annoyingly I can't actually show you the top scorers from, but I can show you the season. This is why I need to remember to do that. 31 points we won the league by in the end. Uh, 112 goals scored. Very comfortable, really. Could have been more, but we had to rotate. We'd won the league basically before we even had to trouble ourselves with Europe, which was nice. Uh, Bray came up 
went down again. Uh, at one point, it was looking very bad for them, but in the end, they kept it to only 103 goals conceded. It was looking much worse than that at one point. I think their goal difference was over th minus 30 after like the first seven matches. So they managed to wheel it back a little bit there. Um, but European qualifiers as well, annoying that Sligo Rovers are in the Champions League. I would have much rather it been Bose or Dundalk, but it is what it is. At least these four are probably the four strongest sides that we have, although you can see just how far off Scamrock Rovers were off the other three. Uh, there's real and there's real money flying through Dundalk at the moment, so I expect them to be a real competitor next year, hopefully in Europe. And Eric Doran was the top scorer in the league. I think he got 25 in the end, which is actually his second best season ever. Uh, nowhere near the record, which is Gregerson's 34, but still very good. And in the second tier, Shelburne won it at an absolute canter with 67 points, but Waterford uh, failed to go anything beyond it. But look at that, Waterford finished 20 points clear of third spot. They still lost the playoff game, but they did finish so unbelievably far clear. Uh, the fact that there was only eight points between ninth and second is mental. Athlone Town though sadly uh, down there at the bottom of the league again and Galway who were not that long ago in the top flight really have languished in the second tier now are looking really really in trouble but Shelbourne who of course played in Europe for us this year are now back in the top flight where they probably should be so this is the twit the tactical tweak we made. I just want to quickly show you now, of course. It's a bit weird at the moment, but yeah, so it's a, a Trecotista on the Alaku roll here. We also now have a slightly narrower attacking width and no directional stuff here. Now, you might notice as well, pass into space is gone. Um, I'll explain that, but I can't explain that without showing you some other stuff first, because now it's time to talk about Europe. And with the rate that we're blowing through seasons now on stream because of the way things are now structured, you'll probably expect to see one of these recap videos on a weekly basis at this point. We're kind of getting through a season a week nearly now. So they might be a tiny bit shorter because there might be less stuff to discuss, particularly domestically, but still, stick around. Oh, we had Dinamo Zagreb in the first round of the Europa knockouts. And if you recall, apparently I predicted in the last recap video that we would get Manchester United should we progress. Hey, look, that's what happened. And it was a real shame uh, because Man United, of course, went on and won the whole damn thing. And their run was extremely easy to the final. If we'd have got any other side of that draw, I think we could have gone extremely deep into Europe this season or this season here. It's a real shame that we got lumbered with Man United. And you can see there, held out until the 79th minute, but then Kulishevsky and then a brace from Sancho bedded us, sadly. And then away at Old Trafford, of course, Sancho and Luke Harris. Uh, Vosterick did get one back for us at Old Trafford, but 5-1 and out. What? They have no business being in the Europa League. It's an absolute shambles uh, that we got lumbered with that. But it, again, you can't have those kind of results because it can really stymie yourselves as far as European progression particularly when we've got a Europa League final that's going to come off of our uh, record very soon, and that's going to be a big problem. But nevertheless, we were back into Europe for a new season, fresh minds, and of course got to go in at the third qualifying round this time around. So we got to skip a few rounds, which was good, as we found ourselves away against Cluj, 4-0 victory there. Doran, Millie, Kubek, easy. Second leg at home, slightly harder actually for us, admittedly, with Moses and Emmett Doran getting the goals, and Shoot got on back, but it didn't matter because it was 6-1, and we were through to the playoff round, where we would play Malma, because of course it's Malma. We play them every year. And weirdly, we did not make easy work of this one at all. Uh, Millie gave us the lead. Willie Person equalised before Alaku, of course, doing mad things, gave us the lead for a 2-1 victory in Sweden, which was then matched with a one-all draw in Ireland. Uh, Florida Man was set off in the 69th minute. Nice. Alaku again uh, gave us the lead in this one as well uh, before Kasimi equalised for Mama. So only a 3-2 aggregate victory against them. Uh, and I was a bit worried because, of course, at this point, we'd invested in our new tactical style and we were wondering how well it would work against better opposition in Europe because it seemed to work brilliantly in the league, but we were very worried about it. So I'd actually built a new tactic with a DM as well, but we haven't actually used that yet. And uh, this is where things get very, very interesting indeed, because we got pot two, thanks to our coefficient score personally. And that meant that we had the plummest of draws probably that we could have got. Uh, we got Inter as our pot one side, obviously us as the pot two team, Villarreal with the pot four team and Hearts with a pot three team. So a very favorable group, you might argue. It's a sort of group where there isn't really an outright weak team, but there isn't really an unbeatable strong team either. We could have either won that group or come fourth in that group, which is a bit of a problem sometimes, and uh, you'll see in a minute. As in the aforementioned first game in that group, we got absolutely twatted by Inter. Uh, Max Norman Williamson, of course, of Tromsø fame, uh, and then obviously Devasolu, and then Yusuf Demir made it 3-0 before Moses Mayani's goal back in the 85th minute, but we did not look good at all all at this point and hearts had been able to pull up a victory over Villarreal as well so we were in a bit of a muddy problem but we always figured that Inter would run, run away with the group but then thankfully we got ourselves a little bit of a reprieve and we thought oh okay things are gonna be okay as we hammered Villarreal 6-1 at Homan Park uh Emmett Doran with four goals one from five threes from the penalty spot Millie got one two we were behind in this game as well so to go and win it by six goals to one with an XG like that dominant performance and I thought you know what we're gonna be just fine uh, these kind of results clearly showed to me that Villarreal were a team capable of being muddied that was, of course, until we hosted Hearts and drew nil-nil 
uh, worrying, needless to say, because we knew that the away game would be a little bit tougher and we just weren't able to break them down very well in the home game. Big problems. Problems which got worse when we visited Tyne Castle and lost 2-0 to Hearts and suddenly had four points from four games. And what made matters even worse on the night is that Villarreal beat Inter two goals to nil. And then we suddenly found ourselves bottom in a real troubled situation, which meant that we could potentially come fourth in this group and have no qualification for anything after Christmas. Uh, it was a real, real troublesome sight. We then had to host Inter in our next game with Villarreal playing Hearts. We knew in this situation like this that provided that um, Villarreal did us a favour against Hearts, maybe there'd still be hope. Well, we don't need no favours as we beat Inter two goals to one at Home and Park and deserved it as well. Um, Inter took the lead early on through Stasin and I was genuinely distraught at that point because things were not going our way at all uh, then though we made one tactical tweak and it pretty much changed our season in a way we turned off pass into space as we were noticing we were giving the ball away way too easily in weird positions particularly in these games and it changed us five minutes later Doran equalizes for us through on goal and then in the 62nd minute Millie with a brilliant goal made it 2-1 to Treaty and a massive win pretty much wrapped up third spot for us at this point uh, because I think Villarreal had beaten Hearts which meant that Hearts would then have to win at Inter and have us lose on the final day in uh, Spain to actually not get third. So we were at least guaranteeing ourselves Europa League after Christmas after looking very, very stagnant at one point in this series. But then final day of the year, we did it. We went away to Spain and beat Villarreal on their own patch as well. And it started off poorly for us again with Villafaina giving them the lead. But then Emmett Doran's equaliser prior to halftime. And then with eight minutes to go, he scored the winner to send us through to the knockouts of the Champions League for only the second time in the club's history. Now, how good or bad that is... I honestly would have rather we drawn this game because had we drawn this game, we'd have got third and we'd have had a chance in the Europa League after Christmas because I still don't think we're in a good position to really be challenging much after Christmas in the Champions League just yet because when you come second, you get horrendous draws and we're not capable of competing with those sides yet. So it is a bit of a real sticky wicket for us, you might say. But you do at least get loads of money for it and you do get a big coefficient bump just for qualifying but not compared to what you'd get for like even just getting to the quarterfinals of the Europa League, which I feel like we could easily have done uh, given the draw that I think Villarreal got or Hart uh, for getting through. It was pretty damn simple. I think it was a Polish side they got drawn against. But needless to say, really good to see that we were capable of doing that and we're actually capable of winning uh, as many games as we were in our group and got 10 points in the end, which is, I believe, our best ever performance in a Champions League group. So I guess there's that good. Plus, again, that tactical switch made a huge difference in this game as well. And it was after this game that we decided, you know what, pass into space, that's gone. This style of football works way better when we don't do that. And it just looks so much better in those two games. The fact that we were so good in those back-to-back -back matches saved our, saved our asses, really. It was a hell of a time. But you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, cool. So you qualify for the Champions League knockouts. But who did you get? Hey, would you believe it? It's Man United again. Uh, we got Man United again. So it, we're probably going to get knocked out immediately. Which is a real shame, uh, really, because it's going to cause some problems for us coefficient-wise. Now, it does look, thanks to us qualifying, that that should still give us a positive result this season, as we'll now come on to. Because we've kind of got a little bit lucky in that Russia are losing a really good year and replacing it with a really bad year. Even though our season, I mean, look at the state of this. 5.3. That's disgustingly poor, but that's what happens when you only qualify for the Champions League. <laughs> um, but there you have it. Uh, but needless to say, that has now allowed us to leapfrog over Russia because they're losing a really good season, and thus we're in a better spot. So we should be able to move up to at least 12th this year, which is actually more gains for us too, uh, despite Bulgaria having a really good season themselves. Uh, they're kind of mudded. I think it's unlikely that we're going to lose that spot. We're kind of just in our own little patch now, but it's that 10-point season I'm really worried about because you can see we've kind of regressed since then. It's almost like losing Zlatko Savic is really bad for you. Imagine. <laughs> it's almost like losing a world-class striker is really bad for you and being unable to replace him. But hopefully we can sort of pick things up again now. And also remember, this year was the first season that had five Irish sides in Europe and thus it was split between more teams, which does often cause you some problems in itself. And speaking of those Irish sides... This is where things get very interesting. And I wish I could show you stats for the season for the players, but unfortunately I, I can't really do that because we don't have any available, which is a shame. But it's basically been the usual suspects this season. There's really been no new breakout stars, let's put it that way, other than Kubek. And as you can see from this lineup, this is pretty much the lineup we've been going with all season. So Mate's back from his loan spell and has now been a starter for us. And with the exception of Barry Cunningham, Carpen, who's mostly played there, that's pretty much been our lineup for most of the year, with, ex with a few exceptions. And the same kind of thing applies to the bench, really. But this is where things get interesting. Champions League. 
Dundalk knocked out Olympiacos 5-1 on aggregate in the qualifying round. I couldn't believe it because obviously it shows you because we're in the same competition as them. So I was just pressing space bar like, oh, they'll lose that. And then it's 5-1. 5-1 away from home. They drew the home leg nil-nil. Um, Olympiacos only scored a penalty in the whole tie. Mental. Sadly, though, didn't quite go so well for them in the second uh, of the two games as they lost 7-1 on aggregate to Benfica. Uh, not really a huge surprise. They did, did score against Benfica. <laughs> so I'll give them that. At one point, it was 2-1 or, or something in one of the ties, which is pretty good. But yeah, they were never going to get through. But by losing here, yeah. weirdly and i didn't realize this if you lose at the league path third qualifying round not the playoff round that still gives you guaranteed europa league group stage you don't drop down really weird so as a result of that dundalk ended up in the europa league group stages so big money for that huge money as for the Europa League, uh, sadly, Shelbourne were knocked out at this point, being a second-tier side. That being said, they only went out 3-2 against Pauk. <laughs> they damn near qualified, <laughs> which is actually very, very impressive. And they, of course, dropped down into the Europa Conference League third qualifying round. Scarlet Rovers, of course, dispatched FC Diffidange in the first or the second qualifying round. Very, very qu comfortable wins in both games to qualify for the third one, where they then were able to get passed by Duj of Liechtenstein as well, which was excellent news. Unfortunately, Bohemian were knocked out by Harduk Split, which is a bit of a shame, but not really surprising. But then in the last qualifying round, oh, Oh boy, was it close. Shelbourne only lost 3-2 on aggregate again to Icor of Sweden. So damn close. And also, Scamrock Rovers only knocked out on penalties by Rijeka. They damn near qualified for the for the group stage. We had two sides in the third the fourth qualifying round who were inches away from getting... We nearly had four sides in group stages this year. What a difference that could have made. But we're definitely seeing progress, though. We, we just are. Sadly... Dundalk's group was about as bad as it could be. Dortmund, Partizan, Marseille, and them, of course. They lost every game and only scored one goal, which was in the very first match. They damn near got a draw against Dortmund, but unfortunately conceded a couple of late goals, like really late on. So such a shame. But getting there is still good for them. I mean, I would have much rather them gone into the Europa Conference League groups. I think they would have had a chance there. But at least they've got a lot of money now, which is really good. They sold a good player as well for like two and a half million quid. Plus they'll get like at least seven, eight million for competing there, which is big money in our league for them anyway. So that should allow them to really establish themselves over the next couple of seasons as the second best side for us i suspect and that's good news because it means that they will hopefully start to compete more in europe and anything if anything this season having them in the europa conference league could actually be even better for ireland because i think they could get all the way through this time around i really really do i think this year in europe once we get back round to it i think we're going to have three sides in, in group stages that's my prediction anyway I, I think it can be done and the finances of course extremely healthy at the moment 40 million pounds in the bank we're all looking very good but of course we're going to be trying to spend all of this money and strengthening our squad massively trying to farm some other players to strengthen the other squads of the other teams too on top of that which is very very good news so that's what we're going to be doing live over on stream right now so join me if you will because uh, honestly by the time you finish watching this video we'll have probably signed like five guys that's how much we are desperate to get stuck into signings today to really stop this squad from stagnating because you can kind of feel that happening anyway Anyway, um, hope to see you over there soon. If you have enjoyed this, drop a like. That would be fantastic. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. That would be gorgeous as well. Obviously, I stream on Twitch. We talked all about that. Uh, yeah, so go follow there too. Join me over there. Say hi in chat. Uh, even if you're new and you've never checked out a stream, maybe step over today. Make today your first time. We're lovely. Well, chat. I'm a dick. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Hold your gun. Capybara. Bye-bye.